it is my, my duty now to ask the two speakers to come to this table and we will have a discussion series, uh, half hour discussion session. And uh, the rule is, of course, that you are absolutely uh, welcome to ask questions, but first identify yourself. Who would like to have the first question? So can I can I have the first question to take him say with your permission? So as we discussed that, my best friend Her Satmari and I, some ten years ago or twelve years ago in Wolzinger's Institute, the Stumman Forum, uh, participated in a conference on language origin and language, many were there, maybe you two, I don't remember, but Anyway, the idea came up that Ursh and I worked on this, we haven't published it yet, that uh, the human brain during its fast development in the last couple of hundred million years practically developed luxury circuits. So there are many areas of local networks which are in a way luxury networks because all the major functions are already there. So the rapid development of the cortex provided space, extra space for extra luxury circuits, and certain functions competed for this extra circuitry and occupied it in an, like an amoeba. So there was something here in the prefrontal cortex, in the broca area, which was not needed for other functions, so we suddenly jumped on it and occupied it as language. So, and then it proved to be a very successful function, so it rapidly occupied other areas, Wernicke, the contralateral side, and so on. So it proved to be a very successful function, which was not developed per se as a new function. There were other possibilities, but it became a more successful of those many competitive functions, which rapidly occupied like an amoeba. So I know this is a hypothesis, but what would you say about that? Yeah, I actually, I read, or wrote a paper on that which never got published called The Language Amoeba Hypothesis, oh, yes. but I didn't know you had anything to do yes. with it. Yeah. Well, to some extent, of course that's true, because evolution has no foresight. So it's not like we can imagine, oh, humans, you know, well, we need hierarchical grammar, therefore we're going to create this circuit that gives us that. that so that can't... That obviously isn't the case. So clearly, to some extent, we had to have some chance mutation that led to an expansion, which then proved itself to be useful. So I agree with you in so far as that must be true. I think that's, that's definitely true. On the other hand, brains are very expensive, and they have to pay for their living. So we, we, we see very clear in, in evolution, we see very clear evidence that if something's not doing its doing a useful job. The cave, cave fish's eye is a good example of this. If it's not doing anything good, it goes away. It slowly gets um, downregulated and eliminated. So I think if it weren't the case that this hierarchical structuring that plays a role in music and language and other things had been useful enough to pay for itself, to pay its way, um, it wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation or any conversation at all. So, so whereas if you ask about the first step, so how is it that the first, human, the first humans got these brain areas and started using them, I think the answer is clearly yes. On the other hand, the fact that, we're, that everyone, that, you know, that happened in some hominids and not in others. Some of our ancestors got it and others don't. And the only ones who happen to be here anymore on the planet are the ones who got it. So to that extent, I think we have to tell a selective story that's not just the amoeba story. Identify yourself, please. Hi, uh, I'm uh, Rama. My name is Rama. I'm a postdoctoral fellow here in School of Computational and Systems uh, Engineering Sciences. So, uh, first of all, thank you for both, uh, the, both the talks. So, my question is for from the first talk. So. Uh, you presented a study, uh, it was a very fascinating study, where you uh, 
we talk, you talked about the uh, direct cortico vocal connections uh, for example say birds which can actually imitate the speech right so do we have like some studies where from other animals which do not uh, imitate cannot imitate speech other than the primates but they do have co uh, cortico vocal connections so the answer is no. Currently, the only species that are known to have these direct cortical motor connections are species that are vocal learners. That's not a very strong statement because there are thousands of species that have never been looked at, but at least we know that birds that aren't vocal learners, like chickens or um, these sub who aren't, aren't vocal learners, do not have these direct connections. So it, it, in biology, you never say never. I would never say there is no species that has X. That would be stupid. But, I, but at least all of the evidence that we have is consistent with this hypothesis. But maybe to go one step further, the place where we have very strong evidence, not, not in the vocal domain, but in the motor domain, so basically hand control. Now, in, in this, there have been many studies. Hundreds of, of different species have been analyzed from the point of view of how much control do you have over your fingers. So for example, if you look at a cat, cats basically treat their hand as a whole thing, and, and they don't have individual control over their individual fingers that you would need to, say, play the piano. So cats don't have that. They also have no direct cortical connections onto the motor nuclei that control the fingers. But now if you look at chimpanzees, they do have these connections for finger control. Um, and, and in other primates, there's a kind of graded, so some primates have it, some primates don't. And in all of these cases where you have these direct cortical connections, you see individual finger control. So that's another body of data where we have much more data that I think is also consistent with this idea that the direct connections are very important. Thank you. Uh, well, can I ask one more question? Sure. From the Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this question is for Dr. Enfield. So, uh, okay. Uh, it was a very uh, like wonderful to see. It was very wonderful to see like how like uh, this conversations they follow a similar pattern across the languages. So like, what do you say about like uh, the the written uh, the writing part? How does that contribute or like varies across the languages? Or is is it like some? Will it be if we study that aspect of the language? Will it be different from just the oral language? Like, what do you think? Yeah, I would say certainly it would be different. Um, you, you mean like written forms of language? In the work that I was describing, um, you know, the sort of basic hypothesis is that, you know, if you want to understand, if you want to look at language from a kind of universal perspective, you want to look at its kind of wild type, if you like. You want to look at the kind of way in which it's used, um, you know, sort of in its most basic form, and so we avoided things like ritual language that's got to do with, you know, giving church services or sort of very formal oratory. Um, written language would be, you know, another sort of version of that type of thing, where it's a very particular type of uh, context, very particular type of format, also a very recent development in the history of language, right? Um, so, you know, I think that that's not the kind of, it's very interesting in itself, but, uh, you know, in terms of how it's been used and accepted and taken over and all of that. Um, but for us, what we wanted to get at was sort of the, you know, the, the most common and the most basic form of, of, of language, uh, particularly for, partly to sort of get at what is basic about language, but also to be able to compare. So most languages are not written. Uh, and most of the time that language used, it's, you know, it's in a kind of conversational context. This type of setting is uh, obviously unusual. Uh, so that was kind of the reasoning, and in, and, and in a way, I mean, there would have to be constraints on what kinds of things could be written and how they'd be written and so forth, but our sort of working idea was that, you know, the variation is going to just be that much greater. You can make up all sorts of rules for formal uses of language, um, and, and so what we were trying to really focus on was the, uh, the, the context of language where the fewest constraints are applied. Atsushi had a question. As since finger dexterity, since Takamasa has brought up, I cannot help asking this. Uh, for the direct connection from the cortical motor neuron or the finger control, two weeks ago they published a paper in mice that in, they have transient expression of the direct control, and that was eliminated by a, plex, a gene called PLEX uh, A1. And you didn't know that. And then the point is that 
this elimination was suppressed by human specific, uh, specific uh, regulation factors. And that means that it was not emerged by connection, but it was disappe suppressed disappearance by human specific factors. So since you brought up, is there any non-vocal learners that have a direct connection transient in the development stage and eliminate it? So I don't know of any evidence for this. Thank you. That's a very interesting study, and I'll go look up up immediately this is very striking. after dinner. No, that sounds exactly exactly what. So Terry Deacon talks about this in his book, The Symbolic Species. So where do these direct connections come from? And his argument is that essentially during brain development, you've got a competitive process. So we have these cortical neurons. They're going to be sending they're going to be sending axons down into the spinal cord anyway. They're going right by the motor neurons that control the larynx, which are in, in the medulla. So basically they're going by, and what, what Deacon suggests is that they transitorily make connections to the motor neurons, but then they're outcompeted by these indirect connections, by the, the basically the midbrain innate vocalization system. So in other words, what happens in most animals is that you'd have these transitory connections, but then there's a competitive process by which the direct connections are lost in most species because they're outcompeted by the kind of innate vocal repertoire of the species, which I think is a, I think a plausible hypothesis that has not really been tested. But then I think what you're, what you're suggesting is what, we, what I would like to look at is the developmental effect of these plex genes. So when are they expressed exactly? Because presumably, once in, you couldn't, ex, you couldn't remove these, this inhibitor in the adult animal and suddenly get it um, get finger control. You'd have to do it at a very particular moment of development, and that's of course in mice a, a testable hypothesis. For the vocal learners, maybe you can look into the developmental stage, the transient expression of that. Yeah, and some of the work that uh, Kazo Kanoya has done about the connections between HVC, the higher vocal center in birds, and RA, it's not the same, it's not the direct connections. It's one step up from that, but that also indicates a very fine. These are with uh, coherence, different expressions of coherent patterns. There's a very fine temporal window where the, the two coherence uh, need to be correct so that the neurons kind of shake hands and then they can make these connections. And once that period is passed, it's too late. So, yeah. Beside that mechanism, the question, important question, why does human specific genes suppress those animations? And that genetic analysis can be done in your body have been proposed. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. The lady who had that. Sorry. <coughs> you can use it. Yes, please go ahead. Press. Okay, thank you. Uh, Hilary Chappell from École des Études en Sciences Sociales in Paris and visiting professor here in Linguistic and Multilingual Studies. I had a question for, for Dr. Enfield. Thank you for your talk. Uh, it was to do with the question answer format and the conversation analyses that you've carried out with a large number of different languages. And you also mentioned Australian languages, where I understood from a lot of studies that in fact it's not really culturally appropriate to use. Or, or, it's, or not even culturally characteristic to use the question-answer format in these uh, cultures. So I wondered if, well, I, I, don't, I guess you didn't have uh, any Australian language in your study, but if you came across this in some of the other um, analyses that you carried out, and also how would, you, how would you treat or handle this in languages if it did turn up, because you showed really uniform response rates across a lot of uh, genetically unrelated languages, which was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's been this work that no, you're no doubt referring to where people um, have sort of reported that, you know, when, um, so it's probably Diana Eads' work maybe you're referring to, um, and she, you know, was looking, for example, at legal proceedings um, in Aboriginal Australia or Ab Aboriginal Australians involved in legal proceedings and saying, um, you know, that the, the whole structure of a law court is, you know, this adversarial question, response, question, response. It's saying that, you know, people were having a lot of trouble coping with that type of situation for cultural reasons, that, you know, you don't sort of put someone on the spot and interrogate them. Um, in, in that way, um, you know, it's more nuanced than this, obviously. But um, the point is that people have been looking at this sort of data in everyday interaction, 
uh, in Aboriginal Australia, and there's no constraint, you know, whatsoever. Um, so people like uh, your old colleague Bill McGregor, um, you know, who's an expert on Kimberley languages among other languages in Australia, you know, I, I recall him saying that's a that is a well-known view that you know you don't ask questions in Aboriginal Australian languages, but it's not a general fact about those languages. It's it's specific to these types of cultural situations, and if you just look at people's everyday uh, interactions. The kinds of questions we're measuring is stuff like, has the water boiled yet? Uh, you know, is John still here? Um, that sort of stuff. You know, those are those are questions, and they're also questions that you're accountable for responding to. But they're not the kind of thing that someone like Diana Eads is writing about in those legal settings. So it's just another example of where something that's quite marked, a little bit of a, a distinction between languages that's uh, you know that's quite marked, gets gets uh, quite prominent in people's consciousness and then gets uh, sort of passed on. And so we, we now have the view that in Aboriginal Australian languages you don't ask questions. Actually, it's not the case. Yeah, I wanted to follow up because one of the things that really surprised me, having spent some time in Japan, was the very short lag and increase in interruptions for the Japanese data relative to, say, English or Danish. The Danish doesn't surprise me. But that seems exactly the opposite of what I would have predicted, not just on hearsay, but on my actual experience in Japan, that they're so worried about politeness and so over, if anything, overly careful about that, that I really wouldn't, that, that, that data point really surprised me, that the Japanese of all these languages were the ones who were interrupting each other the most. So can you clarify it? Well, there might be two things here. I mean, one would be, you know, sort of similar point to the, to the one I was just making, which is that, um, you know, perhaps, you know, in a culture you can imagine that the sensitivity uh, in a formal setting is different. Uh, whereas in a highly informal setting, so they might, you know, you might have a group of people responding in a certain way to you and you're a respected visitor and you're, you know, not a, you know, it's not really informal. And in certain cultures you've got a much greater difference between the formal and the informal. And our study was really strictly about looking at people who uh, live together in the same home or village know each other well, completely informal. So one, one sort of issue is that you know, the, the, the metric can be changed you know, more or less, and so we were sort of strictly trying to look at the everyday situation. So maybe it's the case that in the, in the Japanese case there's just this stronger difference. There's another kind of wrinkle to it, and that is that you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a practice in some languages, Japanese being one of them, where um, you know, the, the constant feedback that you give uh, to, uh, to you know, hey, 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 that, that's also the word that you use when you respond, when you say yes to, uh, yes, no question. Um, so we were aware of this and this was, you know, there were cases where it was easy to, dis, you know, to discount a certain response, but, you know, there's also, there's the possibility there that the multiple functions of a certain word that has the yes response function, you know, that that can introduce some kind of, uh, it could contribute. Oh, nice. yes. Paul Gagnon at the Kong Chen School of Medicine. Fascinating. Uh, because this is about um, evolution, one of the things that um, intrigued me was that some 30 years ago I read Julian James, The Breakdown of Consciousness, The Origin of Consciousness, The Breakdown of Bicameral Mind. So, and in, in, in what he postulated there was that, you know, in small tribes there was no need for language and that uh, basically we, uh, through right hemisphere, we could connect from a, on a telepathic basis. And that he argued and or hypothesized that it was as the tribe began to migrate, the tribe grew larger, migration patterns uh, uh, became governed by distance, that the necessity for language communication evolved, which uh, presupposes, I suppose, the movement to uh, the left hemisphere, uh, a kind of a response. Now, have you heard any more on that? Has that been debunked? Is that just witchcraft? Or, I mean, I thought that, uh, because we don't really know at what point precipitated, what is the causality that, you know, and they engineered this cortical motor cortex uh, phenomenon? <laughs> well, 
I think certain aspects, like the use of the word telepathy, I think we can we can leave that behind. But there is a core, I, mean, I think what James, I remember reading that book when I was quite young, what he was really getting at was this idea that the separation between the two hemispheres, um, well, the separation and the interconnection, so both of those things played a crucial role in human language. Now, what we can do today, how we can update that story, is that it's very clear from brain imaging studies. So the old idea is that the language is in the left hemisphere and music and art and emotions are in the right hemisphere. That's all from, from patient studies, from brain damage studies, and I think the modern era of, of human brain imaging in the last 20 years has very clearly shown that we drastically overestimated the degree to which the brain is, is asymmetric. So in particular, we know many functions of language, in particular, the kinds of functions that you're talking about. So things like humor, things like conversation, things like metaphor, all of these, what you might think of as higher levels of, of anyway, higher hierarchical levels of language use are very, are, are particularly in the right hemisphere. But in general, if you just look at word meanings, for example, both hemispheres get lit up exactly the same. It, also with music, it used to be music is in the right hemisphere, no. Depends very much on your expertise, but for expert musicians you see bilateral representation of music. So actually I think this whole idea of a bicameral mind has broken down based on the modern data. What James would say if he were here today, I'm not, I, I, that I can't um, speculate. Yes, over that, please identify yourself. Um, I'm Patricia Lorenz, I'm a uh, lecturer at the Centre for Modern Languages here at um, NTU. So, um, my question is to first speaker again. Um, there has been a lot of research done or data that I read about, about uh, studies on whales and their complexity of language and the fact that recently I read another paper that there seems to be uh, different groups using different languages, which means the, the um, communicate kind of globally across oceans, but uh, distinctly different, using distinctly different patterns that are only used in specific groups. Um, the complexity that I know about seems to be definitely a complexity that shows like a linguistic kind of use. I mean, not just words or sounds, but actually structural communication and that could be classified as language in our, in the human sense of you know, what, what, what do we call? So have you done, my first question is, have you done any research on any kinds of whales or dolphins or anything in that group? And the second question is, um, how, you know, what is your opinion on that? Okay, that's a complex, so, so first of all, I haven't done research on dolphins and whales myself, uh, but I know all the people in the world who do, and we go to the same meeting, so I'm quite up on the literature. But the central problem of your question is, what do we mean by language? And so I would like to make a distinction based on the, if, if, we t if we look in humans, let's distinguish between music, and by that I mean instrumental music or music sung without words, so non-lyrical music and language, the way we're using it right now. Now, music is very structured. It shows local, um, local variation, so it's different in India and China and, and, and Europe. Um, it has, in many ways, the same kind of hierarchical structure that I was emphasizing in, in language. But we don't say that because someone um, is good at playing the saxophone that they're good at language. We make a distinction. Most languages do make a distinction between music and language. So most of the people who study bird song, whale song, they call it not whale language, would say that these complex systems of communication, and there are many in many different species who have vocal learning, that seem to build up something like a hierarchical structure, but it doesn't have the same semantic content as we have in language. So, so Peter Tyak, who's one of the experts in humpback whale song, would say, no, this is song, it's like music, it's not like language, because there, all of this complexity, same as in a bird who sings this very complex song, it's not in the service of conveying specific meanings, rather it's in the service of conveying the sort of virtuosity of the singer. So the example, back to this, the cultural change, there's a beautiful example in humpback whales where all the humpback whales in Eastern Australia sang a particular variant of the song. In any given year, everyone's singing the same song. It's like the hit, the hit for those particular whales. It's different in Australia than in Hawaii, than in, in the 
Indian Ocean. But what they were able to capture is that some, a few whales, a few male whales, moved from Western Australia, from the Indian Ocean, over to the Pacific side. And all of the whales on the east side basically picked up this new, this new hit, this new song that they were singing. And so that spread very quickly. Within a few years, everybody was doing the same thing. And now they've been following the spread of that through the Pacific into, you know, further east into the Pacific. So what I think this shows us is, yes, there are dialects. B, these are learned, and, and these are clearly vocal learning species, and these are very complex songs, but I don't think we're ent entitled to conclude from any of that that this is a language, that the whales are, say, talking about where there's a good place to find food or, or sp specifying any particular intentional or uh, propositional information. Okay? Um, but is it not a question of how we define language? Because when you say, I mean, the, the definition of like, okay, it might not be where you find food, but it might be like communicate a sense of belonging or togetherness or whatever, which is also language in a way. Um, so is it not more like, and, and yes. when you say the argument to say, oh, we call it whale song, I mean, that's a bit of an arrogant statement to say, okay, we call it song and therefore it's a song. I mean, we haven't asked the whales, haven't we? So especially if you deny telepathy, like as a form of communication, then we actually kind of have, you know, the, the problem is really yeah, yeah, what, what do we so do you do you see any any question and answer pattern for example in in the whale song or whale communication it, has that been recorded or is it purely a one way kind of thing for me that would be a part of language because when you have a question and answer then there is an interaction so I mean that's just a a definition. Okay, so so yes, I do have a definition of language. It's any system which allows its users to convey anything that they can think. And so by that, I possess English because pretty much anything I can think I can express in English, but I don't possess Italian because I know how to say buonasera and pasta and adante, blah, 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 but I don't have, I can't say anything I want to in Italian. Okay, so that's a very practical definition, but it's one that has been applied. This is actually less relevant to whales than to dolphins. So the place where we've looked most closely would be in killer whales and in dolphins, particularly bottlenose dolphins. And there people have set up very specific experiments way back in the 70s where you have two dolphins on either side. They can't see each other. They have a vocal link. And yes, they do go back and forth, but they don't have the capability. For example, if you set up a task where you they both have to push the red button at the same time, or one knows the answer and the other one doesn't. They chatter back and forth, but they don't seem to have this capacity to say, just push the red one this time. So I think there, there, there are clear experimental evidence against this being a full language. That doesn't mean that it doesn't help them bond together. It, it, I think, just like music, they do exchange, and it does help them feel together, but that's not, that doesn't make it a language. It's not really a follow up on that, but it's another question, um, you know, in a way for you. So, I mean, I'm just very interested to know what you think about something that I mentioned, um, which is that in terms of these, you know, we have these very complex animal communication systems uh, of all kinds and they're incredible. Um, but there's this fact that, that animals don't do this thing that I've referred to as repair. They don't get the other one to repeat what they said. There's no way in which they can, for example, well, for, for example, hold the other one accountable for not having produced a response that they expected, uh, getting them to repeat what they said so they could hear it better, or you know, catch what it actually was. You know, was that a warning call, or you know, was that a leopard call, or an eagle call? You know, yeah, exactly. So, but you don't get it, right? And that, what I want to know is why, why is that the case? What is it that's, that, I mean, that is just so basic, so fundamental to, to human communication. It's not something I talked about today, but we've, we've measured this, that it's just, you get some form of sort of request for repetition or clarification more like every minute and a half in human conversation. You just don't, it's not a thing that animals even do. So a question here is why not? And what is missing that such that they don't do it? Well, one, sort of element to it is that when you do do that in, in, in a language, you're using the language to talk about the language. Yeah, so there's this kind of reflexivity that, that, you know, that I'm referring to the thing you said and I'm able to make that reference. So I wonder whether that, you know, whether, whether that is the thing that's missing. 
And if so, I mean, there's, a, there's an interesting relation between that and, and these issues of accountability. One argument is that it's actually that very possibility of using language to talk about itself that allows you to do all of this kind of moral accounting and so forth. So um, can you comment on that in relation to animal communication? Yeah, well, that's, that's another big question. Uh, so let's start with, a, I think an important distinction would be our evidential base. So what do we know? And absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And then come to this question you asked about sort of metalinguistic, the use of the communication system to talk about itself. So I, I don't think we can say that animals don't have repair. So even in the, in the given data, the Siamang and given data, what we see is that these duets, so the males and the females are singing these tightly interlocking songs. And sometimes things go wrong. Sometimes like the male sings before the female has done her boom call. And what they often do in this case is they just stop and they start over. So it's kind of like, rather than saying, what, what, what did you mean with that? They just say, oh, that, that didn't go anywhere. Let's try that again, you know, one more time from the top. And so they have to repeat the whole thing. But to the extent that then sometimes they actually get it right, then, you know, then everything's hunky-dory. So that at least is something that seems to be in going in the direction of repair. Another case that's maybe more convincing is with male birds, in many cases, uh, when two male birds are duetting, let's say you and I are, we have neighboring territories. If I sing song A, and you sing song B, and I sing song C, and you sing song D, everything's fine, we're just defending our territories, we're staying out of each other's way. But as soon as you sing song A, and I sing song A back, that's considered aggressive in many species. That, that's already sort of upping the aggression. Now there's two things that can happen in that case. Now you can sing song A again, and now you're saying, oh yeah, okay, let's, and the aggression goes up again. Or you can sing song B, and as long as I go and sing song C, then everything goes back to normal. But if you sing song B, and now I sing song B, okay, now we're getting aggressive. So it's, it's the same sort of thing. It's a kind of conversational contour that is maybe going in this direction. Now, on the other hand, there's no doubt that using language to talk about language is something that we have no evidence of in non-human species. I mean, I'm not even sure how you would find, you know, what would even be a, or gesturing in that, direct, that right direction. But so, yeah, I mean, I think that ability to use language to talk about the products of previous language, that clearly is something pretty special about our species. Last question, due to the <laughs> limitations of our time, please go ahead. Um, yeah, my name is Yvonne, I'm a PhD from the School of Humanities um, um, Linguistics Division. I, I study international um, stuff as well. So, um, very good combination of talk um, from the individual aspect and the social aspect of um, evolution of language. I, I love it. <laughs> um, I actually have two questions, but they're kind of related. <laughs> First, applying the social um, aspects on the individual side, I just wonder, um, are the animals which are more sociable, would they have a more complex or advanced uh, um, communication system? Um, that's for Professor Finch, Fish. And then for Professor Enfield, my question is, how do we study um, cultural evolution of language when we don't have recordings of the last time? We, we only have recordings recently in the last, I don't know, 60, 70 years. So how do we actually measure those um, silences? So how do, how do people do repairs last time? How, 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 how our languages become the ways they are today when we cannot see the evolutionary um, process? I'll let you think about that one. <laughs> That's a hard question. So it's a very popular, very well, very old hypothesis that social complexity leads to increased intelligence, the so-called so social intelligence hypothesis or Machiavellian intelligence hypothesis. And I think there's plenty of evidence for that. The big problem becomes A, how do you measure social complexity? And B, how do you measure intelligence? So both of those are difficult empirical problems. And so there's been a lot of argument. But I would say in general, there's a, there seems to be some convergence of data that those animals that live in more complex social organizations, so for example chimpanzees, also have larger brains and are, and, you know, are able to pass various cognitive tests. Now the question, but you, you, you were just interested in their intelligence and their cognitive abilities, you were interested in their communicative abilities. And there it's much harder to find any connection between these things. So some of the most complex 
vocalizations that we know about would be, for example, for these humpback whales, the males spend most of their time alone. So they're not living in a particularly, at least as far as we can tell, a very complex social environment. Or, for example, in birds, which have very complex song, also not living in the most complex social environments. And then you look at non-human primates or uh, hunting dogs or lots of other species that have this very detailed and complex, or ravens are another example. Ravens have amazing complexity in their social interactions, but they don't really even have a song that's clearly a song, and it's certainly not all the stuff they do isn't as complex as, say, a blackbird or, or something like that. So I think the, the underlying idea that you had is correct about cognition, about social complexity driving cognitive complexity, but it doesn't seem to map very directly onto communicative complexity. Um, yeah, well, it's a terrible um, problem, but it's nothing sort of new in terms of linguistics. So, you know, you're asking about how can you talk about, you know, um, things like how, what sort of length of pauses people would leave in, a, in the past, right, in a former period of language. Well, the same problem is there if you're looking at things like what words did they use and what grammatical constructions did they have. Um, you know, languages don't leave fossils, um, and that's because of the form in which they're instantiated, you know, it's sound waves and they go away. So, you know, you've, you've, you've got clear limitations and, ling you know, linguists argue about what those limitations are. There's the classical sort of historical method where you compare modern forms of language, you hypothesize about what the common ancestors, of the, you know, what the regular sound changes must have been, but it's always conjecture. So, I mean, I think sadly there's no, um, way to actually kind of get a handle on it. But happily, uh, there's lots of languages around and they're being spoken all over the place and we can measure this sort of thing. I mean, you know, in terms of looking at language and social interaction, it's, it's, it's a tiny proportion of what's been done in, um, in, in the study of language. So we know quite a lot about the structures of sound systems and the structures of grammatical systems around the world. I mean, a lot less than we could know. But in terms of things like, you know, systems for repair and interaction or the timing of turn taking, so little is known. So I don't think it's really a problem yet. Um, the first, you know, there's so much empirical work that can be done now that, you know, if you're worried about finding things to do, uh, you know, that I wouldn't worry about that. There's plenty of work to do. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, our time is out. But before I give back the word to our host, Jan Fassbinder, as a tradition, I would like to ask our two speakers about, say, please summarize in two minutes what are the most important challenges in your field, what you would like to see to be solved in the next five or ten years. So, two minutes. First speaker. So we need to know more about the neural basis of semantics and, and the kind of sociality, shared intentionality, theory of mind, this whole domain of things. We really don't have a very good understanding of the neurobiology of this. And for all three of the things that I talked about, syntax, semantics, and speech, we still don't really understand the genetics. So I see the genetic, basically understanding how genomes work, and in particular how the differences in the human genome relative to chimpanzees, how they determine these neural underpinnings is, is the million dollar question. And like I said, it's a good thing because it doesn't require a time machine. We don't have it. It's, it's just normal. It's what all the medical and, and mouse people are doing anyway, which is why I'm optimistic that we might get the answer. Thank you. Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, well, you know, I guess that the thing that I would really like to see happen in this space, at least the space that I kind of talked about, was really to uh, work on the connections between these different causal frames that you might want to think in, in terms of thinking about language. And it's, it's about connecting, thinking what are their interrelations. And so in some, I think in terms of the possibility space, there's been important work looking at certain connections. So the diachronic and, and the synchronic or the sort of role of language learning in language change. So these, these are ways in which sort of little uh, pairs of these different frames are getting linked, you know, causally. But I think there's no sort of general theory to try to link them all up. Um, and, and to my mind, one of the reasons for why that is is because the, of, of the lack of attention to what I was referring to as the enchronic frame. 
which is the frame of social interaction. And that's where you get uh, a lot of phenomena that are not on the map in the study of language. So things like you know the repair and, and the turn taking and all that sort of stuff. And it's also where you get the, the most uh, explicit expression of all of these uh, aspects of the social interaction or social intelligence, you know, joint action, shared intentionality, all those things are actually observed in the enchronic frame. So to my mind, um, you know, if, you, if, it, if that's where we really want to get, you know, work and trying to kind of link all of those pieces in a larger kind of picture. So what it, what it will require is kind of some serious attention uh, to thinking about the sort of not just pairs of those pieces, but sort of everything all together, um, sort of conceptually. Um, but also empirically, you know, coming back to what I was just saying um, to you, uh, the, there's also so little that's known about the possibilities of human language in that, in that area. So we know a lot about a small number of languages, but it's nothing like what we know about all these other aspects of language, the phonology, you know, what kind of sound systems there are in language. We know quite a lot. What kind of syntactic structures there are in language, we know quite a lot. How conversation is structured, not so much. So I think that's really where we want to you know, put in a lot of effort in those, in those two areas. Thank you so much, and it is my duty to give back the word to Jan. Right. Thank you. You fulfilled your duty. <laughs> um, well, uh, there's not much I want to say, this, except I want to thank the two speakers and Balash for their, most of all the two speakers, for their, for their uh, talks today, for the enlightening us on that aspect of evolution. Balash for leading this conversation in a brilliant way, as you always do. Um, and to thank you for being um, so, so, how do you call this, so loyal to the, to the series. Uh, and I would very much hope that you would continue to be loyal also next time, next time we will have, it is the 18th of September, we will have two, um, at that time I think we'll be in the range of 10 to the 4th uh, years before today, that's the, uh, the, the kind of the, 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 the Anthropocene and the development of, of settlements and, and communities. Uh, the speakers will be um, uh, Steve Lansing, who is a, a, a local, so he's at NTU, and another one is um, Roland Fletcher, who you might know. Uh, so they're both very good speakers. It's a very interesting topic. So I hope you will see. We'll see you back in, uh, on the 18th of September. The meeting will not be here. It will be at the National uh, Library. But we'll send you more details on the, at the in, in the near in the coming week, coming two weeks. Okay. So thank you very much.